episode of the Bear Down Podcast. Special guest today, the voice of the Wildcats, Brian Jeffries. Brian, thanks for joining us today. Matt, great to be here, as always. Absolutely. Do, I just wondered, do I get the parting gifts now or when we're done? Uh, when we're done, off okay. camera, so we don't have to make promises to anybody else. All right, thank you. So, Brian, I want to start like we always do with these. Go back, start at the beginning. You, long before coming to Arizona and Tucson, you grew up in Washington State. Correct. Tell us a little bit about your childhood in the Pacific Northwest. Well, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, which uh, nowadays is a suburb of Seattle. At one time, it was uh, its city uh, of its own. Uh, just a typical growing up, nothing special at all, uh, but loved sports and uh, loved listening to games on the radio. And of course, to date myself a little bit, uh, there was no ESPN at the time. So it was, if you watched a game on TV, it was on Saturday or Sunday and that was it. So everything else was on the radio. So listening to the Seattle Supersonics when they were there and uh, the pilots in their one season and minor league baseball in Tacoma. And so I just fell in love with radio and the idea that I could hear somebody broadcasting a game on the other side of the country and they would paint the picture and I'd close my eyes and feel like I was was there. And so it fascinated me. Originally, I wanted to be an architect, but I couldn't do math. And so uh, the fallback was to, to get into sports and, and broadcasting. So I, yeah, I was probably about 14 when the bug hit me. And, and I, I know I speak for a lot of fans, Brian, you have that announcing voice, you have the play-by-play -play voice. When did that sort of come to a fruition as a, something of, you know what, I can actually use my voice to, to do what I want to do? I, I don't know if there was a time when all of a sudden I, I had that realization because I didn't think of myself as having a great voice. And so I think once you get into broadcasting and you start doing it on an everyday basis, and I was a, like everybody, when you get into radio, I was a rock and roll disc jockey for a few years before I got to solely concentrate on sports. And so getting to be on the radio every day, you kind of self-train yourself, I think, and you become better because you go back and listen to yourself. If you want to be good, you go back and listen to yourself. And uh, that's the way I feel like I developed was just the idea of knowing what sounded good and what sounded bad and, and doing what I could with what I had. So I think we all want to know more about the rock and roll DJ. <laughs> yes. Ryan, what was what was the station? What was what was the hour? What was the programming back then? Uh, KQOT, uh, Radio 94 in Yakima, Washington. That was my first job. Yeah, we played top 40 music. Uh, I did the uh, morning show. And then when I was done with that at 10, I went down to City Hall and got the news. And then at noon, I did a half hour newscast. And then at night, I would do high school football or basketball and or American Legion baseball, whatever happened to be going on. What was the transition point to, for you in your career to go from rock and roll into sports? Well, after Yakima, uh, I went to Boise, Idaho for a couple of years and did essentially the same thing. And uh, at that point, uh, I'd moved up in the market, in a bigger market, and that was the idea. And I'd been there for a couple of years, and a friend of mine lived in Tucson and called me and said, hey, a new radio station just got the rights for the University of Arizona. And so I sent my resume and my tape in, and they hired me uh, to do football sideline reports and the basketball pregame and postgame show. And so uh, in conjunction, guess what? I was still a DJ. So I worked the seven to midnight shift on KMGX in Tucson when it existed. So I played music Monday through Friday and then did uh, the games on the weekend or sometimes weeknights when, when it was basketball. So did that for, I want to say, you know, close to what, four or five years, maybe six before things kind of just developed and the rights would change hands and uh, I started working part-time for the rights holder and part-time for the radio station. And then there was just a point there where the rights holder said, we're willing to hire you full-time. And so I left the radio station and, and have been doing what I've been doing now since. So for how many seasons would you say you were just on that sideline kind of? Six years. The first six years I lived in Tucson, um, I was, was sidelines. I was... Uh, pre-game, post-game for basketball, did some baseball back then uh, a little bit, and uh, and still worked at the radio station until things changed. So your first play-by-play -play venture for Arizona would have been with football, correct? Uh, actually, basketball. basketball. So uh, 
uh, Ray Scott, who was doing the play-by-play -play at the time, one of the all-time greats, I wouldn't be here without his guidance, uh, he didn't like to travel a lot. And so uh, both the NCAA tournament game in uh, Albuquerque and the following year in Long Beach, I got to do those because uh, Ray didn't want to travel. And that's also what kind of kicked off the football side of it because uh, Arizona qualified for the uh, 1986 Aloha Bowl. And Ray did not want to go to Hawaii for the holidays. And I said, <laughs> and so that was that. And then he retired the following spring uh, and, uh, and I took over after that. So your first full season doing Arizona basketball play by play, 1987-88. Yes. Uh, got it at a good time. Yeah. Uh, a final four run with right. under Coach Olson your first year. What was that experience like? First year and out, deep run like that. Well, I mean, my head was spinning the entire season because for me, I'd done nothing but high school or small college sports before. So I always felt like I was behind. But uh, it was it was wild because, of course, it was one of the great seasons in Arizona history. And, of course, we get to the final four and – uh, I bought no souvenirs in Kansas City, didn't buy any. <laughs> because again, I was going 100 miles an hour trying to figure out where to go and, and what to do. But I thought, well, that's okay because I'll just get souvenirs next year when we're back. <laughs> again, being naive enough to think that, oh, we'll just we'll come back and do this again. Then coming to the realization that, well, you don't get there every year. We've been there plenty of times, but not every, every year. year. Yeah. So when did you start then your first season of football play-by-play -play duties? Uh, same fall, fall of 87. Fall of 87. And then baseball came a little bit later? Well, I'd done some baseball with uh, with the, the late and great Dave Sitton. We had done it together for a few years. And then it was actually probably late 80s, early 90s when he moved on to do television full-time. And, and I did you know solely radio after that. So your, your tenure... Um, uh, which is, I think, interesting in that I don't think a lot of play-by-play -play people do what you do, which is football, basketball, and baseball all on a yearly basis. For you, what is the differences between calling those three very different type of games? Well, actually, it kind of changes starting in the fall because football is extremely intense because of all the work that goes into it, all the players that you have to keep track of in a football game. Whereas then basketball, you've got fewer players, you've got more games, but the games are also shorter, the action's a little bit faster. Uh, and then baseball is almost like a step back. And there's also there's kind of a serenity at that point where you're at the ballpark, it's a beautiful night. And of course, baseball is just a slower sport. So I'm, I'm very lucky and blessed because uh, I have a different season to look forward to all the time. And then after baseball, I get the season of doing nothing for a couple months, which is <laughs> which is good. So under under some Hall of Fame coaches that you've worked with uh, for all three of those sports, Lou Olson, Dick Tomey, Andy Lopez, all legends in their own right, mm -hmm. iconic coaches in their sport. If you can just give us just a favorite memory or, or story from each of those three folks in your in your regular encounters with them. Well, I mean, there's a million stories involving Lute Olson and all the great things he did. I mean, on the court and what he did off the court. Um, and I mean, you know, because I was fortunate enough to be able to, to know him in a different sense, I think, because we had we worked together. And that's what I always appreciate about all the coaches is that I have a job to do. They understand that. And they're they're always great about it. But, you know, Lute was such a humble man and just a. I just an easygoing guy. I mean, I know he could get excited at games, but away from that, you know, he was a husband and a father and a, a grandfather and so on. So I guess one of my, my, my favorite, well, I don't know my favorite, but one of them, one story is that uh, before every game, we did a pregame interview. We did it well in advance of the game. And on road, home games was easy. We did it at practice day of the game. Road games, it, it varied because of what time the game was. And so I remember we were playing a game and I think it was in Los Angeles. Uh, it was an afternoon game. And so that morning I called his room and I said, coach, hey, you know, when can we do the pregame interview? He says, well, why don't you come up to the room? Which wasn't unusual. I mean, I'd done that before. So I go up to his room, knock on the door and he opens the door and he's standing there in a t-shirt and basketball shorts. And he says, come on in. He says, give me a minute. I got to finish ironing my shirt. <laughs> well, anybody that's a Wildcat fan knows that Lute Olson was, impeccably dressed man. 
never a I mean, never a wrinkle anywhere. <laughs> so I sat down and he's ironing this shirt. And I mean, I'm not kidding you, Matt. It must have taken him, I swear it took him 20 minutes to iron that shirt. Every little Crease, wrinkle had every and every, everything had to be perfect. And so when he got done, we did the interview. And, and that's just kind of the way he was. Um, you know, Dick told me the best thing that Coach Tomey taught me was football because I never played football growing up. And uh, I think early on, after I became the play-by-play -play voice and he and I would talk, he caught on the fact that I didn't know all the, the <laughs> nuances of, of football. But he taught me. He wasn't afraid. He, he sat down with me at times, would explain why they were doing things and what they were doing. And that was invaluable because of somebody that, hadn't played the game before. I played basketball before, not at a high level. Uh, and I played baseball at a very low level, but uh, football was one because I was uh, 139 pounds in high school that it just didn't work. So uh, I will never forget him for, for that. And uh, Andy Lopez is just, uh, I mean, he's one of the all time favorite people. Uh, I mean, just the way that he dealt with his players uh, you know, everybody just loved him. Uh, he was just a guy. It goes back to pregame interviews again. We'd, we'd sit in the locker room and he'd be changing his socks and we'd be doing an interview. And he, he had a great way of framing the games as we would go into them. And uh, he was not an intense guy. You know, he was, again, was just kind of a laid back guy. And that's what I, I loved about him the most. And you know, he, you know, his family and everything was always first for him. So it was just, it was fun. And of course, winning a national championship never hurts. So you have this amazing run of success, calling amazing teams, iconic teams, national championship teams. I, I, I'm sure if I asked you for a favorite moment from each of those three seasons, a national championship, 97 with men's basketball, 2012, Andy Lopez run, probably, probably those top, but non-national championship moments that you look back to still to this day and still put a smile on your face? Well, in basketball, it was, uh, that would have been 1988 Kingdom in Seattle, Arizona and North Carolina in the regional championship game because Arizona had never been to a Final Four. And when the Wildcats won that game and Tom Tolbert's dancing on the court, <laughs> that's one I'll never forget. I mean, the national championship, obviously, I mean, that you can't beat that, that is the top. But that moment, because it's the first and only time you earn that first trip to a Final Four. I, that to me, that was, I still get chills when I think about that. Um, football, a uh, couple of games, uh, people think I'm crazy, but Arizona beat Oklahoma six to three at Arizona Stadium in the late eighties there, mid to late eighties. And that to me was just a tremendous game. I mean, you know, beating Washington where they were number one and, and that sort of thing, beating Miami at the Fiesta Bowl, beating Nebraska uh, at the Holiday Bowl. I mean, those are all great memories. Uh, but that Oklahoma game, because it was just a regular, quote unquote, a regular season game, that one always stands out to me. And baseball, um, gosh, I'm, I'm trying to think of how many different ones that uh, I've seen that have stood out. You know, other than Omaha, I'll just go back to last year winning the Pac-12 championship because that's one thing that Arizona hadn't done. They'd been to the World Series. They'd been to the playoffs. But winning that outright Pac-12 championship, it was in, we were in Corvallis, Oregon, and had just beaten the Beavers to take the series. And then the game down in Eugene was going to help determine. And so here all the players gathered out in the outfield watching on somebody's phone. And that game ending and seeing the joy that they had, knowing that they had a championship. So when you have these... Uh highlight calls, whether it's a moment, whether it's uh, the wrapping up or the end of a national championship one, is that something for you that's spontaneous or do you sort of have a framework of, hey, if this works out, this is, this is how I want to remember this moment? I've tried, if we get to a championship moment, I have tried to formulate something to think, okay, I need to be prepared if this is going to happen. I wouldn't necessarily, I don't write it out verbatim but I want to have something in mind because it's a, it's a special moment. You don't want to pass it up. Uh, other games, no, I never think about the end. If it's a last second shot or a game winning home run or you know, a field goal or whatever that might win the game. Yeah, you have to just, that happens. That just happens naturally. But I try to be prepared 
in those moments when a championship is on hand. Now you've got the highlights, uh, and then you've got the stories from your journeys on the road that aren't highlights, some very interesting stories. Most recently, obviously, the fog out you had at Washington State with football. But Washington State was the site of another one of your more unbelievable stories. Yeah. Men's basketball, 1980s, and a venue change is, is the setup I have for you on that one. We, uh, we were on the bus. We got to Beasley Coliseum, where the Cougars play, got off the bus. We noticed, I noticed at least, I thought, you know, the lights don't look like they're all on. And we walk in the door to Beasley and the lights are not on. I mean, it's not dark, but you can barely see the court. No one's there. And so, you know, Coach Olson is looking around and finally a guy comes out and says, hey, the power's out. There's no power in the building at all. And we stood there for a while while discussions were going on as to what to do. And of course, we're there, what, an hour and a half before tip. And the decision then came that they couldn't get the power back on. So we were going to play the game at Bowler Gym which is Washington State's version of Bear Down Gym. It's their old one, and it's across campus a ways. Well, this is in January, so there's some snow, it's cold. The bus, by the way, had left. So we all walked across campus through some snow uh, to uh, Bowler Gym. Now, it was not ready for a basketball game, and so they were scrambling. Fortunately, it was all they had, the court was there and everything, and so they had it all set up, uh, and they were scrambling to do that, but there was no facilities for radio. And so at that time, all we needed was a standard telephone line to do our broadcast. And the Washington State people, they had enough on their hands. They, you know, they were trying to get a game going. They weren't going to be able to help me. So I actually, there was a hallway that I went down and found a, a door ajar, opened it. It was, a, as I found out, it was an assistant football coach's office. <laughs> And sure enough, there was a phone. And so I unplugged the phone. Uh, we had an extension, which we always carry a phone line, and ran the phone line out the door, down the hall, into the gym, <laughs> and plugged it into our equipment. And that's how we got on the air. And uh, I think we went off the air a couple of times and had to get back on because it probably wasn't a real steady phone line. But uh, And then, on top of that, the place is packed. So because... Uh, it's standing room only. I think they just let everybody in. They were going to take tickets. <laughs> and then Arizona just, I mean, blew out Washington State that night. I mean, it, it, yeah, I th it was like a 30-point margin, if my memory is correct, or something close to that. All over a phone line. All over. Venue change. Not even before shoot around, before the game itself, okay. reviving the game. Yeah. One of my favorites from you, Brian. And now, uh, in, the, in your job now as the voice of the Wildcats, I know everyone – listens to your calls, you're known as the, the play library broadcaster, but you have you have some other duties as a side, as it were. Uh, you you host you know our coaching radio shows, coaching interviews, whether it's on radio or on video. Uh, you became kind of our default Zoom MC when we were doing everything <laughs> over Zoom with fan calls and alumni calls and and, and, and donor calls. Um, you know what is maybe a favorite thing you do outside of just calling a game? Well, my favorite thing is coming to work every day because being in this building, McHale Center, and being around the student athletes, um, I always say it keeps you young. And uh, to me, that's just a joy to be around them on a regular basis and, and the coaches. And it, it is like a big family. And so that is my, my biggest joy is just knowing where I get to go to work every day and what I get to do and the contact I have with them. And it's a busy job. I mean, for nine months out of the year, I'm, I'm going strong, but uh, that's what keeps me going is, uh, is the people, the support you get here. It's, it's unbelievable. And one of those uh, marquee events you, you emceed, Brian, was the recent Lou Wilson tribute in McHale, which I know was a special day for you. Yeah. Um, just well, your favorite reflection or memory from that cool day on the floor of McHale there. Well, it was seeing all the former players back again. I, I don't know how many programs in the country can bring back that many that would come on their own and uh, because of their love for coach. Uh, and just to look across the floor there at McHale and the countless number, and I'll go beyond players, you know, former assistant coaches, uh, former athletic directors, uh, former staff members, former managers, I mean, you name it. I mean, just leaders of the community. It, uh, 
it tells you the impact he had, which I think is, is very apparent. Uh, the gra- I've always thought, you know, the greatest single person to live in this city since I've lived here because of what he did for the city. He won a lot of basketball games, but it went beyond that. And, and that was reflected in the people were there. And I think the emotions you saw, and you know, it had been a year uh, since his passing and still to see those emotions was, was really special. Now, uh, most fans may not know this about you, Brian, but you are a kind of road trip connoisseur, I would say. <laughs> You like to find the local spots uh, throughout the Pac-12 footprint for coffee, uh, for any type of beverage. Favorite spots in the Pac-12 footprint when you when you go on the road? Oh wow! Okay, well let's see. We'll start up north. Uh, Thirteen Coins in Seattle, open twenty four seven, three sixty five. Can't beat it. Uh, let's see where else. Uh, Claude Felters in Eugene or in Corvallis. It's right across the Oregon State campus. Burger and a beer for like eight bucks or something like that. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, Beppe and Giano's in Eugene, Italian, one of the yeah. best places I've been. Uh, Bay Area, uh, yeah, there's a lot of places there, but uh, Hobie's is a great breakfast place there. And that's the meal that I usually know I can get every day. So uh, there's a couple locations there. Uh, LA, there's probably way too many to, <laughs> to name to name one, there's um, Uncle Bill's Pancake uh, House out at uh, Manhattan Beach. That's really good. Uh, Salt Lake City uh, has one of those uh, Brazilian steakhouses. Yep. And my partner on, in football, Lamont Lovett, uh, diets for a month before we go to Salt Lake City <laughs> because it's all you can eat. And uh, it's uh, that's a great place. Rodigio, I think, is the name of it. Uh, uh, Boulder has... Um, has I think it's the Buff Breakfast, um, something. It's right next to the hotel we always yeah. stay at. So I'll, I'll throw a shout out too okay. for one of our spots in Spokane, Brew oh, Bros. Yes, Brew Bros. Coffee, coffee shop. Yeah, one of the best. Love to find the uh, the local coffee shops, which you know is not easy sometimes. And you know we you know I don't have a car, so it needs to be within walking <laughs> distance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You've been in this community now, Ryan, for for decades. Do you still get recognized by your voice or by your looks from fans on the street here in Tucson? Yes, uh, probably more so by the voice if I say anything, uh, because I got into radio because I kind of like the idea of being anonymous. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when you've been around for a while, that kind of disappears. And then the video work I've done and so on and so yeah, it you know everybody's always real nice, and so it it happens. Not a lot, but it happens. At the grocery store, at the bank, where's the, where's the last time someone heard heard you speaking and said, "Oh, that's Brian." Uh, it was actually uh, at uh, I was uh, I was over for the uh, Jedfish Radio Show at Union Public House. I hadn't even gotten into the building. I was walking through the courtyard, and um, I don't know who I was talking to. And some uh, a woman about thirty feet away said, came walking over and said, um, "Are you Brian Jeffrey?" <laughs> I thought I recognized that voice. <laughs> so over your career, I'm going to hit you with some some hard hitters here, Brian, with okay. some fast questions for you. Hardest name to pronounce? Uh, well, we had a we had a football team one time. Our quarterback was George Malaulu. Uh, our right tackle was Nick Finney on Ganofo. And we had a wide receiver the, by the name of Olatide Ogunafitami. <laughs> and we always thought, oh God, what if they all got in the same play? <laughs> and it did happen. Wow. Yeah, it happened. So Malaulu threw the pass to, um, and, and Finney on Ganofo had to throw the block for yeah. Olatide Ogunafitami. And so, you know, I think at, by the time I got all three names out that, uh, he was probably 40 or 50 yards down the field, but uh, that's the one that uh, it took a, a lot of practice. Is there a, a, a Wildcat student athlete that you've been able to st- stay connected with long after they're done playing or you have regular contact with still? Well, Steve Kerr probably uh, because of who he is and because of what he does now. That uh, And we see him oftentimes when we're in the Bay Area since he's been with the Warriors. And so I would say he's probably the the one guy that I have, I see the most. 
most of the time it's when they come back here and uh, you get a chance to run into them. But uh, but every once in a while, you never know where you might be and somebody's going to show up. And um, I, you know, sometimes we all age. And so it's like, OK, OK. And if they don't have a number on their back, you know, it takes me just a minute to remember. Have you ever been asked to record someone's voicemail message? Yes. Numerous times. Numerous times. Numerous times. And what do you? What's the greeting you go with when you? Do Whatever that? they ask for. <laughs> they they write the script. I just I just do it. Uh, favorite broadcaster you, you admire today? Well, wow, there's many. Uh, I mean, I'll go back to Ray Scott, and uh, he was one of the all-time greats. Did the Green Bay Packers for years, uh, Super Bowl. I mean, you name it. And he was here for the two years and I, I got to work with him for two years. And as I said earlier, without his guidance, I would have never gotten to where I am right now. He was unbelievable with his time, knew everybody in the business. Uh, when we go on road trips, I mean, I met all kinds of people, but you know, there's just been uh, a lot of, when I grew up in the, in the Seattle area, listening to Bob Blackburn, who did the Sonics, uh, Bob Robertson, who just passed away recently, was the voice of the Washington State Cougars for 40 some odd years. And I actually lived, I grew up three miles from him. Wow. And it turned out, I was talking to a buddy of mine, we were in uh, junior high, I was talking to a buddy of mine and we were discussing, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I told him, you know, I'd love to be like Bob Robertson. He says, hey, Bri, he's my next door neighbor. <laughs> and I thought, you're kidding. And so I rode my bike over to Richard White's house and I would wait outside hoping Bob Robertson would pull into his driveway. And it took a few weeks, but he finally did. And I got to meet him. And it turned out to be then a lifelong friendship because he invited me down to watch him work and we kept in touch. And then of course, when I got the job here and he was at Washington State, I mean, we, we, we continued to be friends and uh, he's a wonderful man. So your career has come full circle now with your son Brody following in your footsteps, the, starting his first year here with the women's basketball play-by-play. -play. Did you always feel like he would inevitably get into broadcasting as a calling? No, no, I did not. And I don't know that how soon he was interested in it. I think initially, no, I, I, I don't think, maybe he did, but he never told me. And it was his, he'd been at the University of Arizona for a couple of years and he was aiming for a business major. And, but then he just, he had friends that were doing that and he wasn't sure, okay, exactly what path he wanted to take to get there. And, you know, he liked sports and everything. And so he decided to, okay, I'm gonna change majors now and get into communications. And so uh, started working for the campus radio station and did a lot of games for camp radio. And uh, I still didn't know how serious he was uh, until really his senior year when he kind of said, yeah, this is what I, I want to do. And so he graduated this last May, uh, looked for jobs all over the country. It's, it's a tough business to get into. It's very difficult. And so the few things that came up were not full-time jobs. And so he just he couldn't pull the trigger on it. The women's basketball job opened up late. Uh, and uh, he had great contacts here at, at the university, and he'd done the women's games either on camp radio or on the streaming, and so he was familiar with the team and so on, and uh, and so he got the job. And it was all, I didn't I, I I said I'm not helping you, Brody. You need to go in and interview for this and get the job on your own, and uh, and he did. And so I'm extremely proud of him. I think he's got a great future. He's smarter than I am, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and uh, it's it's not easy. It's And I've warned him that it just doesn't happen overnight. And, uh, you know, I was here for six years before I got the play-by-play -play job. I got turned down three times. And uh, that's the story a lot of people go through. And so I, I think he's got a, a future. If he keeps working hard, uh, he'll make it. And this is a, a great start for him. When you hear him calling a game, what familiarities or similarities or, or things of yourself do you hear reflected in what he calls? Um, Other than that, that voice. I think that's it. I mean, he really wants to, he wants to be himself, which I am glad. And what I tell him and I tell any student that asks, I says, don't just listen to me. 
make sure you listen to different play-by-play -play broadcasters. You don't want to pattern yourself after one guy. Number one, you have to be yourself. But number two is there's nothing wrong with stealing things from other people, but don't steal it all from one. Make sure you you listen to a variety of people. And I think he's, he's done that. And I tell students to do that all the time because I think that's the better way to grow. But never forget yourself. You've got to be you. And uh, that was hard for me early on because I wanted to be one of, you know, I hear the other guys and say, hey, I want to be like him. But when I realized that I had to be me, I think that's when I kind of, uh, I, I don't know, open the door opened then to get some things, I'll call it better in the business. So when he's calling the women's basketball season opener, Cal State Northridge, and doubleheader here, Mikhail, and remember playing after that, that had to have been a special day for you, special night. Just what you, were you listening in? Were you courtside listening to him? What, what was that experience like? Oh, no, I, I, did, uh, I did not want to be close by. Again, I wanted him to do it on his own. And yes, I sat in my office and listened. And uh, no, I was, I was really excited for him. And uh, I thought he got off to a great start. He's got a, a lot to learn, but uh, he's, he wants to learn. And so that's the key to it. The biggest, and we've had some games that have gone on now at the same time. We've had the men and women playing almost the same time. The biggest challenge here is his mom. <laughs> because then you know, she has to decide who she's going to listen to. And uh, this past weekend, I know she ran, she's run into that problem before. And so I know she's listening to him more than me because she's had a, she's listened to me for a long time. <laughs> well, it's, it's an exciting time for Brody, an exciting time for you, obviously, well, with him involved and also uh, calling another great season of, of Arizona sports here, Brian. So I want to thank you for joining us here on the Bear Down podcast and uh, want to wish all the listeners and subscribers and watchers out there. Uh, happy holidays, happy Thanksgiving here, and we'll bear down here starting with a busy weekend after Thanksgiving.